Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the uh, third in our series of uh, Baxter and High Crozier Law uh, webinars on this fascinating piece of legislation, which is causing all sorts uh, of problems and issues and challenges for people in all the industries, and uh, no more so than the travel industry. I'm very pleased to be here today with my colleague, Asunta Mazotta, and we are hoping that this session uh, will be one uh, in which we get to mostly answer questions. We do have the presentation and we will uh, go through it. <coughs> Excuse me, but as uh, I say, it would be best for us and for you, we hope, if we can deal with as many questions as you have. So before we move to the first page of the presentation, uh, let's just talk a little bit to situate everybody about this wonderful thing, Canada's anti-spam legislation. Uh, if you were to read the press, whether it's the local media or the national media or the travel media in the last couple of months, you might think that it came out of nowhere and that the government only put it together uh, after a long Christmas party. That's not the case. In fact, it's been out for some time. The process to start drafting the law started about 10 years ago and the piece of law was passed, but it wasn't put into force in 2010. They also put together drafts of the regulations, which are the items that put in the details to the overall law, uh, and sub circulated those to the public back in the summer of 2011. There was some feedback uh, as a result of that process, and some changes were made. And now we're, we think, at the point where it's all finalized because we're told it is coming into existence on July the 1st. We have it in Canada um, not just because we as Canadians think it's a great idea, but because most of the developed countries around the world have recognized there is a need to put some form of regulation or control in place uh, with respect to this wonderful technology that we've all embraced but can sometimes be a little bit difficult to deal with. As I said, it's not happening only in Canada, it's happening in various countries. But you'll probably hear people say or you'll read uh, that in fact ours, the Canadian version, is considered to be the most all-inclusive or aggressive uh, in terms of all the legislation that is around the world at the moment. So what are we dealing here with? Well, we're dealing with the, a basic principle that says uh, spam is bad and the corollary of that principle which says anything that reduces spam is good. And those are wonderful statements and those of us that receive significant amounts of email every day uh, will be happy, I'm sure, if we can receive less of the stuff that we don't really want to have to clean from our inbox. Uh, but those general principles get to have all sorts of details. And the federal government has put in place uh, details so that we have the law itself, we have regulations by the CRTC, we have regulations by Industry Canada, we have some guidelines from CRTC as to how the law and the regulations should be interpreted. We have some frequently answered uh, questions that are asked questions, I should say, uh, that have been put out by the CRTC. And we have a regulatory impact analysis that is also out there for everybody to have a look at. Uh, the detail, or the devil, as Doug would say, is in the details. And it's those details that we are going to address today. So I don't see any questions. But we're hoping there will be lots. And let's move on. And so Asunta can tell us about CASEL. So CASEL is a federal law. It's uh, regulating the sending and the content of commercial electronic messages, uh, which we will be calling CEM. Um, as uh, Tim mentioned, it comes into effect on July 1st of this year with respect to the CEM. Um, CASEL also deals with the installation of computer programs which we're not going to be dealing with in this presentation. Um, but the, the computer program installation um, clauses come into effect on January 15, 2015. And then CASEL also has private claims, which can be brought through 
three years after it comes into force on July 1st, 2017. What is a CEM? Uh, CEM is an electronic message that is of a commercial character, whether or not it is sent in the expectation of a profit. It includes messages that promote a product, a business, or an investment opportunity. It includes any messages sent by any by means of telecommunication, including those sent to email, instant messaging accounts, telephone accounts, and other similar electronic methods of sending a message. And there are a few exceptions to that, which we'll get in into later on. Um, and it includes text messages, sound, voice, or image messages. So then, um, to send one of these wonderful CEMs on or after July 1st, you're going to need the consent of the recipient, or alternatively some form of exclusion, and we'll get into that as well. And the kind of consent that you need is either express consent, where the person has specifically said, yes, I would like you to send me CEMs in relation to X, or implied consent. And we'll deal with the details of how implied consent comes into being. The sender of the message has to be able to prove that they have consent. And you can do that, obviously, by demonstrating that you specifically receive consent from the person, or, as you'll see shortly, you can show that there was a specific relationship or certain circumstances that uh, came into existence or were there in order for you to have the implied consent. <clears throat> One of the issues that everybody is going to face from a very pragmatic uh, point of view is that after July the 1st, when you send an electronic request for consent, it itself will be a CEM. Now I see we have a question. Thank you, Esther. How do you record consent when using, I presume you mean text messaging, as opposed to text messaging? Um, well, you can get consent a number of different ways. Uh, ideally, the person has done it through some sort of electronic means where they have uh, responded back and agreed to consent. Um, Frequently, it's done through emails or an opt-in list. When you're getting consent, express consent, um, they need to opt in as opposed to opt out. And you need to record the consent that you received, when it was received, who gave it to you. Um, usually, this is done through a website or through email, uh, where you have an electronic record uh, showing that the person has responded or somehow indicated that they have agreed to receive these emails. And Alex is now saying, what about verbal consent? What sort of paper trail? Well, this is something we've discussed uh, over the past few weeks, because verbal consent is perfectly acceptable. Uh, the difficulty is, how do you literally record, in quotes, that consent? Uh, the CRCC has suggested you can use a third, independent third party to record it. However, of course, that's going to be very difficult. So the practical suggestion that we have made is that when you get the verbal consent, first of all, you record it on a piece of paper or typed with uh, your computer, the date, the time, the name of the person, the email address, and you can store that. The other way to do it or to add to that is also to send an email to the person saying, I'm confirming. Mr. Jones, that you have given us consent for the following purpose. That way, you have that record. That's the sort of paper trail we would suggest. Uh, Lana Andes, after July 1st, do we need to get consent for persons already on a database? Well, this actually, this question has, uh, we've been dealing with that today. We were discussing it earlier. It depends how they got on your database. Um, if you've been getting emailed far and wide um, and you're, you can't discern um, if the person got on the database because they asked to be put on or uh, whether you just added them or whether they've made a purchase, you're going to have to go through your database. Just because they're there doesn't mean they can stay there uh, for the purposes of the CEM. Now, if the person has made an inquiry or has made a purchase before July 1st, 
and you have in the past sent them some form of CEM, there is a transitional clause which allows you to keep them until they withdraw consent or July 1st, 2017, the three-year transitional clause. At some point before July 1st, 2017, you would have to reconfirm their consent in order to continue sending them CEMs. Uh, Christine Vincent says, after July, no, I beg your pardon, I skipped the question, how can you have expressed consent via CEM? Well, you can prior to July 1st, as is I'm sure happening with a lot of people whose lists you're on, write to the people on your list and ask them for express consent in relation to a specific kind of message. Don't forget as well that after July 1st, a telephone call would also be considered a CEM, but it's a CEM that's excluded. So you could contact people by telephone, or by fax for that matter, and seek their express consent. Uh, Kayla, how will this possibly be monitored by the government? Well, that's a, a great question. I'm afraid we don't really have an answer for that one. Um, so the, well, the issue of consent will be dealt with by the CRTC. It looks like right now they're going to keep their current uh, method of um, reporting a complaint. CRTC deals with a number of different issues, and you can actually report them online. Um, so individuals can complain about uh, receiving CEMs without consent. Um, there's other issues that are going to be dealt with by other uh, government bodies, such as um, the Competition Bureau or Industry Canada, with respect to um, misleading or deceptive messages, um, and issues with computer programs which harvest emails, which is also included under the Act. Uh, is going to be dealt with the by the Privacy Commissioner. All right. Mary, what about when someone calls and leaves a voicemail for pricing and you don't know them? You call back and get voicemail. Do we need consent to speak to them further? No, you don't. As we said a few moments ago, it's perfectly acceptable for you to use the telephone to contact your clients or possible clients in order to uh, give them details. Um, Richard Carlin, does CASA apply to B2B, specifically travel industry, tourist offices, or other suppliers sending business information to travel agents? Uh, the answer is it does apply. Uh, the question is, will it fit within one of the exclusions? And one of the possible exclusions is the possibility that the entity or the organization to which you or that other organization is sending something already has a business relationship with the other organization, we'll call them the recipient, and you're sending information to the recipient of the email that concerns their business. That's one possibility. The other possibility is that you would simply have to have consent as you do in any other circumstance. With respect to documenting a client that unsubscribes, a uh, question asked by Esther, yes, uh, in, in as much as you have to take them off your list, um, and you have to do so within 10 business days. Um, when a client unsubscribes, you have to just stop emailing them. Uh, you don't have to necessarily write down that they have unsubscribed, but you have to keep a record of the email addresses that have specifically indicated that they do not wish to receive emails from you anymore so that you do not send them emails anymore in the future in error. Uh, question from Al, how is, how is this going to restrict spammers from other countries emailing to our clients without consent? Well, as a, as a legal matter, Al, um, you can't send a CEM unless it's somehow excluded under the Act or you have consent from a computer system in Canada or to a computer system in Canada. So that would affect all of those spammers. They would not be legally allowed to do so. What does that mean in terms of the Canadian government being able to take any action against them? Now, that would be difficult if they literally are absolutely foreign to Canada, but there is an understanding 
that the various governments of these countries will be cooperating in an attempt to enforce uh, the Canadian legislation overseas. Shelley's question about purchasing a database. Um, if the person has consented to be on the database uh, and receive messages, um, you would be able to use it based on the implied consent provisions where implied consent exists if the person has um, provided you or, con uh, or conspicuously published their email address without a statement stating that they do not wish to receive commercial messages and the message has to do with their business role. The problem is, is that at a wedding fair it might be a personal issue as opposed to a business rule that they gave the email addresses with respect to. Um, there might be an issue in using them. I would counsel you to send out an email blast and ask for consent um, if you do want to continue using those, um, especially because if you did not yourself receive consent, but another party received consent, um, you would be unsure of, of whether the, the express consent was of a sufficient quality, essentially, to continue sending them uh, the emails. This also brings up one of the principles under the Act, and that is that when you get consent or when you believe you have uh, implied consent, you really want to know it's consent for what? What kind of message is it that the person has agreed to receive? So in your example, when you pick up the database from the wedding fair, the people who went to the wedding fair knew that there were exhibitors. They signed some piece of paper that said, yes, I'm quite happy to have all the exhibitors send me an email. The problem is you don't know how it was gathered and you don't know exactly what it said. So that will be the difficulty. The risk is that you send it out, uh, at least prior to July 1st, and people tell you to get lost. Uh, but at least you'd be able to confirm that those people were interested in your specific emails from your a particular booth. Uh, Christine, is there a grace period to move implied consent to express consent? Well, if you have implied consent uh, based on a, a past uh, business or non-business relationship, uh, such as somebody making an inquiry or a purchase from you, um, within the three years after July 1st, you should be getting express consent. Um, express consent would not uh, expire as implied consent does. If you have ex implied consent as of now, um, you can continue to email again until July 1st, 2017, or until the person informs you they, do know, they, they don't want to receive your emails anymore um, with any type of consent. As soon as the person informs you they do not want to receive your emails, it's gone. You can't email them anymore. Uh, if I message to a prospect, someone I've never had previous dealings with, says Alex, and ask, how do you book your business travel? Is that considered a CEM? We're using a new test uh, for this one, and that is, you'll answer your own question. And I think in that case, the answer is yes, it's a CEM, and there's a commercial intent there, uh, because you want to get this person's business. Um, JB, would sending press releases to media lists uh, be included under implied consent? Can I understand through the wire that they would have signed up for the company's service? Well, if, if they've signed up for the service, then you've got ex what's called express consent, and having express consent permits you to send the email as long as you include your contact details in it and the ability for someone to unsubscribe. So if, express, if consent was given, then you'll be fine. I think we're understanding that question properly. Uh, the sharing, Rachel Raquel's question of the sharing of databases being a contravention of PIPIDA. It's very possible, that is, if the consent that they received wasn't good enough. Um, if the consent stated what the 
email addresses were going to be used for, for example, to provide to other exhibitors uh, to contact them about wedding products or services, um, then that might be okay under PIPIDA. Um, and if you have good consent under PIPIDA, not always, but frequently, that will be enough for you to continue sending um, CEMs in the future. The problem, again, is you don't know what type of consent they received. Um, it's on you to ensure that the consent received is good enough for the types of messages you're sending. That, whoops, that leads us into our next question um, from Esther. Who is ultimately responsible if the person is an independent consultant with their own clients, however the agent is using tools provided by the agency? Well, I would suggest if we were talking to you, the uh, IC, that you should take responsibility for making sure that you have consent for any message that you send. One way to do that is to assess whether the agency is taking the trouble to determine that it is clear, or there's implied consent, or there's expressed consent. But you need to take it upon yourself, because if any of the federal agencies come knocking, uh, they'll be happy to take you along with them, uh, not just the person who owns the agency. Uh, Christine's question about expiry uh, for express consent. No, there is no expiry period for express consent. Once you have good express consent, it continues on until the person opts out. So as long as there is an unsubscribe option or an opt-out uh, provision or ability to, to opt out, um, you're, you're golden once you have express consent. And Heather asked an interesting question in the context of Facebook. Uh, Facebook would be uh, what is considered an electronic system. And there is an exclusion in the regulations with respect to electronic systems. Uh, we say that exclusion exists because when you sign up for these systems, when you become a Facebook user, uh, when you permit people to, or when you go to someone's page and sign up to follow them or friend them, you've given that consent. And that takes care of what the act is concerned about. And so you don't have to concern yourself about what it is you can and can't do in the context of these electronic systems. Okay, so Tammy's question, if a tourist office uh, reaches out to an agency or industry colleague to arrange a meeting you may or may not have met in the past, you need to send a consent email before you try to reach out to discuss business. Um, if you already have a previous uh, a previous relationship and the CEMs that you're sending out deal with the, the business that the recipient does, you can send out email. Um, if there is not a previous relationship, you can potentially rely on uh, the implied consent provisions. So for example, if the uh, tourist board or the person you're trying to contact has uh, published their email address on their website or provided, to, provided it to you in the past without saying, uh, please don't send me emails about business or commercial opportunities, then you can email them as long as the emails that you're sending deal with what they do, their business role or their, uh, the business that that company does. DMs in chat groups or forums where the message you send isn't directed towards any one individual, the fact that it's not sent to a single person won't change the nature of it. If it's a CEM, it's a CEM. Um, in the context of a group or forum, I would imagine that people have signed up in order to be in that chat or in the forum. In other words, they've said, I'm joining this forum because I want messages. Uh, for example, in LinkedIn, I regularly get emails for groups that I have joined. LinkedIn sends them. They could certainly be a CEM, but I signed up for that, and I can easily sign out or take away my consent for that. Uh, for Facebook, can you advertise specials or promotions on your personal Facebook page or just on your business page? On your personal page, if what you're doing is putting up, um, you're not, 
if you're not sending out the messages to people, you're posting on your own wall, and the only people who would see them are people who have friended you, um, that's fine because those people could, if they decide to, defriend you if they don't want to see the, uh, the ads that you put up on your personal page. Uh, a business page, there's the like button where they can choose to like or unlike the, the page to receive notifications. That's the stuff that you put up on the page. If you're sending direct messages to individuals, that might be different. Um, but if you're just posting on your own Facebook page, that would be fine. And that's similar with other types of websites. The uh, Act is dealing with messages, uh, as in messages being sent or messages being called out to people by way of the phone or the telephone, uh, the phone or fax, rather. Um, okay, I think we dealt with Carl. Yes, so in a ballot uh, box, we can have a checkbox which says, client says, yes, I want to receive future information from X agent, or no, getting emails from X is not good enough for implied or expressed consent. Do I need to specify particular consent information in the ballot box? Well, what you need to do is you need to make sure, first of all, that this ballot is nice and clear, and it's not hidden amongst other things. In other words, uh, signing up for a free trip. So if you use the ballot to sign up for a free trip, I must very easily be able to see that you're also addressing the issue of whether or not I want to um, receive a particular kind of em electronic message from you. And your obligation is, one, uh, to make sure I know who it is it's coming from. Two, to make sure I know what sort of messages. Are they about this kind of travel? Is it cruising only? Are you going to send me adventure travel? Uh, secondly, and three, I have to actively put an X or a check mark in a box uh, that opts me in to receive your email. So can you continue to advertise travel specials on your Facebook page? Yes. Um, people can decide whether or not to like or unlike your Facebook page, um, and that's the uh, that type of platform where the consent option or the unsubscribe option is built in is uh, exempted under the CASA legislation. And speaking of uh, exemptions or exclusions, uh, Christine, uh, as I understand it, you're saying these are messages sent by uh, an employee to another employee in a similar or related entity, and are those exempt? Yes, those are excluded specifically. Uh, so that employees can send what would be otherwise, or are, CEMs, uh, but they are not caught by the legislation. You were, Loretta's question, you were told that you could only post promos on your business Facebook page. I, again, if the, if the people who are seeing your page are people who have friended you, and would only receive these messages if they're your friends, there is the option for them to unfriend you or opt out of seeing what you put up on your wall. Um, so it, with, a, with a platform like that where there is the option of opting out, um, those types of messages are exempt. And also you're posting them on your own Facebook page. Um, they might be a CM, but you're not sending them directly to people. Um, my understanding also is that Facebook also has options. If you don't want to receive messages from certain people, you can block those people. Um, that being said, you may not want to post too much on your personal page, lest all your friends become not friends because they're sick of all the promos. Well, and, and I see here Shelley's indicating it may be Facebook that's suggesting you can't do that. That, I'm afraid, we can't respond to or deal with. That, that, if that's the rules of Facebook, that's the rules of Facebook. Um, it, that may be an issue. If someone fills, Alex, if someone fills out a form to download a white paper, have they affected? download a white paper from a company about whatever it may be, the future of cruising in the Caribbean and are prices too cheap to make it worthwhile selling, uh, that does not in any fashion 
uh, mean that I am going to take whatever you send me in the future. You need uh, consent from, if we're talking about express consent, you need express consent from me to what it is you're going to send me in the future. Tammy's question about if you are handed a business card at a social function, is that implied consent? Um, yes, assuming that when the person has handed you their business card, they have not said, don't email me about business or commercial messages. Um, the email or CEM is relevant to their business role. Uh, for example, if you're emailing them about travel and they're an HR person, it might not be kosher because they're not the person who's going to be booking travel. Uh, Esther, when you sent out the request for the express consent, do you have to include an opt-out option with this communication, or can you imply they will have an easy option to opt out? Oh, you, you have an obligation when you're sending a CEM, again, three basic options. One, uh, obligations rather. One, you have to have the person's consent. Secondly, they have to know, in effect, who it's coming from. And thirdly, you have to provide them with an easy unsubscribe option. If you don't want these anymore, click here. If you don't want to receive these anymore, reply, don't send me. It has to be easy. You have to give them that. You can't start implying that they might be able to opt out. And the question of whether the law applies to direct mail as well, I'm assuming you mean uh, mail through regular uh, Canada Post uh, channels or snail mail. Um, no, that, that wouldn't be an electronic message. Um, it applies to messages sent electronically. For example, text messages, instant messages, email, um, things of that nature. Um, it does not apply to faxes. Faxes are exempted. It doesn't apply to two-way interactive communications or voice uh, voicemail messages left on a voicemail system. Uh, those are exempted. Uh, there might be other laws that deal with those. For example, uh, national do not call list with respect to telemarketing. Uh, but CASEL does not deal with those. that are sent directly to them from the third party. Do I have to advise my clients this is third party access and obtain their permission? Well, that's an interesting question from an agency point of view. If the client has told you uh, that they want information in relation to travel advisories or travel tips or specific kinds of travel, then you've got their permission to send them that because you're a travel agent or counselor, you are sending them things on behalf of others. So it's not that you're getting third part permission to send third party things, it's that you're getting permission from uh, your client to send them the same kind of message that they've agreed to send, or the substance of the message is what they've agreed to. There's a question from Charlene about Twitter. Is Twitter the same as Facebook? Can you advertise on Twitter? Um, I don't know about specific Twitter rules about advertising on personal versus business Twitter uh, Twitter feeds, but Twitter is very similar to Facebook because it has an unfollow option, so you would only get the tweets from people you've chosen to follow. Um, so you can definitely advertise on Twitter, um, and if people do not want to receive their, the messages from you, they can simply unfollow you. Similar. Um communication, is that then going to be uh, caught by CASEL? The answer is no. That's another electronic system, and it has its own processes by which one can join in, sign up, accept to receive, or not accept to receive uh, the sorts of messages that would otherwise be considered to be uh, not permitted. A question from Christine Vincent about the expiry date for implied consent. Well, 
assuming you mean implied consent received after July 1st. Um, there's a couple of different types of implied consent. If it's implied consent based on an inquiry, it's six months after the inquiry was made. If it's implied consent based on somebody purchasing a product from you, it's two years from the purchase of the product or the service. If it's implied consent based on people providing their uh, email address conspicuously without informing you, I don't want to receive email, um, there's no expiry de date that's set out for that type of implied consent. And if you have implied consent before July 1st, there's the grandfathering provision that will bring uh, implied consent into uh, 2014 and onwards until July 1st, 2017. And as with all consent, again, uh, the consent can be withdrawn at any time. Uh, Al's question, you call, you get the verbal consent, how do we prove it or document it? Yes, you certainly should document it. And as I said, you can use good old-fashioned technology in the form of a piece of paper and a pen if that's your preference or you can simply make a note in some word processing file that you have on the computer, you can then decide, or you will need to then decide, how it is you will maintain this, whether it simply goes in a paper folder, in a hanging cupboard that says consents obtained, uh, you can do it that way, or if you're going to store it in some electronic format, you're going to need to know uh, that the electronic format is somehow backed up so that if you ever need access to it, uh, you can easily get that access to prove uh, that the person gave verbal consent. The other uh, practical tip that we mentioned was that it would be a good idea in that first email that you send to the person having got their verbal consent to confirm. Very simply, dear Mr. Jones, I'm confirming that I have your uh, consent to send you uh, CEMs or just messages uh, as follows. And that way you've got your email and if he disagrees with you, then Mr. Jones can send you one back saying, no, 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 you misunderstood me, obviously. I didn't give you the consent. Okay, a uh, question from David Coffey. Uh, for the six months after an inquiry or two years after a purchase, can you send CMs without requiring an opt-in? Or do you have to restrict communication to relate only to the quote or purchase? Uh, you can send CMs for the six months after the inquiry or two years after the purchase, uh, not just with respect to that specific quote or inquiry or purchase, but CEMs generally about the business. Um, you, they do not have to opt in in that case, but the consent will expire. Um, however, again, they can at any time uh, inform you that they wish to unsubscribe, and any CEMs sent out have to have an unsubscribe mechanism. Uh, Tammy, if you have a third party managing and overseeing databases and performing mail-outs for you, if there were issues with distribution, the third party would be responsible or would the hiring office? Uh, it, that's similar to the question talking about uh, independent consultants. Uh, that will depend as between the two of you what agreement you've had, but be assured that the uh, offices who are enforcing this will come after the person who uh, did the sending uh, and possibly after the person who chose to have messages sent in that fashion. So the real issue for you there is to ensure that the sending party uh, is doing so in compliance with CASEL. Alex's question about uh, an email on someone's company website, is that uh, making the email publicly available for messages. Um, yes, they've conspicuously published it. And you can email them if they haven't said, don't send me messages, because they could easily put that on the website. Um, and if the email or CM has to do with their business role. And that was the example that Asunta mentioned earlier. If you know that that person's business role is something to do with travel, either because they themselves do some traveling or they look after travel for the uh, company that they work for, that will be fine, uh, but there will be some circumstances where just because the person who is the head of accounting has published their email, it doesn't mean to say that part of their role is travel and you may run afoul of the act if you start barraging that person 
with those emails. Dennis's question, uh, a series of purchases, does this keep an ongoing implied consent and allow ongoing CEMs? Yes. Every time there's a new purchase or a new or a fresh new inquiry, uh, the time period, the six month or the two year time period starts running anew. That being said, if somebody informs you that they do not want to receive CEM to a certain email and subsequently makes a purchase, that would not necessarily allow you to consider to continue sending those CEM uh, because they have expressly opted out of receiving commercial electronic messages. Um, they can obviously easily unsubscribe, but a better practice would be to have a list of people who have specifically stated they do not want to receive your messages, so that even if there is an inquiry or purchase in the future, uh, you can uh, compare it to the list of people who do not want to get your messages and uh, make sure you're not running afoul of Castle. Wouldn't it just make sense for uh, agencies to send these things out or have someone else do it? Yes, it certainly would. We are counseling uh, clients that they should be now, prior to July 1, attempting to get express consent. Uh, it's a good idea because it will have you in compliance with uh, the anti-spam legislation, and it's a good idea because it gives you a chance to reconnect with the client with no penalties prior to July 1, to get clear on exactly what it is, if at all, they want to receive emails about. How would you provide that their address was made available if they later change the website? Um, well, you would have to document uh, where you're receiving these email addresses. Um, so if, it, if it's been published, um, you should have or try to keep some sort of record uh, because it is on you to prove that there was consent, either implied or express. Um, prove where you got the email and that it was published. You could take a screenshot. Um, you could save the web page. Uh, you could, again, make a note saying, you know, received via uh, the website, uh, keep an electronic file or a paper file that indicates how you got the email address. And that there were not any there weren't any statements saying I don't want to get CEM. Uh, Wendy, you're talking about posting from your business Facebook page over to uh, your friend your sorry personal Facebook page, um, so that people who aren't member of the business page can see the postings. Uh, two things: one, you're within an electronic system, so it would be permitted, and two. If you're sending it to people with whom you have a personal relationship, that's an exclusion as well as the fact that you're dealing with an electronic system. Okay, Mary's question about a travel blog. Uh, in this case, uh, the blogger is a US company. Followers have the option of subscribing via email. Does that cover me? Um, with respect to that question, if there is a, if it's a platform where you can subscribe or unsubscribe, that would cover you if it's within that platform. Um, if you're sending out, they would have to physically go to the, to the blog. If you're also sending out emails, you will need to see and check the type of consent, what, what they've agreed to. Um, if they've agreed to uh, get the blog, great. They've agreed to get the blog. You have their consent. Um, you always have to provide them going forward after July 1st with an option to opt out. Uh, and you need to put in the necessary information about uh, who is sending the message. Um, Castle applies to any messages sent to uh, a Canadian computer, computer system or sent through or by a Canadian computer system. Uh, so regardless of whether it's sent uh, in the U.S. or in Canada, if it's going to somebody with a, in Canada, it's going to be caught by Castle. Um, the option of having a host site with advertisements. If it's if it's a blog site, again, Mary's uh, the second part of Mary's question: advertisements on a website. Um, if the advertisements are on the website itself. It wouldn't, 
be a CEM because it's not a message you're sending to somebody. Uh, they have to actually physically come to your to your website to, to see it. Uh, so they could easily control not being able to see the ads by simply not coming to the website. Uh, Kristen, how do we initially get the consent without sending an email? Well, let's be clear, you can get express consent now before July 1st by sending emails to people, and I'm, most of us, I imagine, are receiving those kinds of emails, seeking express consent. The, again, people that we've worked with, we've put in language to say we're trying to comply with the legislation, would you please click here and give us your express consent. And different ways are being used, but typically the person's name and contact details are put in, and the boxes are checked to receive a specific kind of email. You can do that now, prior to July 1st, without any difficulty, because the law doesn't exist until July the 1st. After July 1st, you may have implied consent, based on, as Asunda has said, an existing business relationship, or the fact that someone has conspicuously published their email address, or the fact that someone has, in effect, written down your email address or given you a business card. In those scenarios, you have implied consent. And implied consent is the same as express consent in that it allows you to send emails. Implied consent just doesn't last forever like express consent or isn't as good as express consent uh, because it can expire. So you can get consent sending an email. You can also get consent by calling someone. You can get consent by faxing someone or having them fax you. You could get consent by someone calling you and leaving a specific voicemail message in response to some ad campaign that you ran saying, hello, it's Tim Law, uh, ABC Travel. I would very much like to receive uh, these once a week newsletters about your cheap trips to the Caribbean. This is my email address. Uh, this is my telephone number if you need to call me. That would be the giving of consent. Now what do you do to prove it? Do you save that recording? Do you make a note of it? Well, chances are you don't want to save it. You make a note of it, you send the email, and in that email you confirm, Hi Tim, thanks very much for your voicemail message. We confirm that you've given us your express consent to send you the following emails, and here's the first one. Uh, Christine's comment about CEMs not including mailers sent via Canada Post. That is correct. Uh, CEMs cover only electronic messages, so anything you send through the mail is not caught by CASEL. Charlene, if we are referred to someone by a friend, client, family, or whoever, and they said that the person was looking for an agent, are we permitted to do an initial reach out to them after July 1? Charlene, you're cheating. You've been reading the legislation, going to sleep at night. Yes, that's one of the exclusions. Um, what that exclusion permits is you don't need the consent of the person. However, when you send that email, you do have to put your contact details in it, you do have to have the unsubscribe mechanism, and you have to indicate the name of that person that, in effect, made the referral. All right, maybe we'll just go through a couple of slides, because I noticed we didn't quite finish this one. Um, excuse me, we've said this a few times, but on this slide you now see on the screen that last point. Uh, recipients can withdraw either type of consent, that's implied or express consent, can be withdrawn. So express consent is great, but just because I give you my consent, I can the next day, the next year, five years from now, uh, take it away. Now, there are certain exceptions under CASEL. Um, there are certain CMs that are not caught. So messages sent between individuals with a personal or family relationship are exempt. Uh, messages sent between employees of the same organization. Messages sent by a representative of an organization concerning the matters of the organization where the person receiving the message is a member of the organization. Um, so for example, if you're part of a club, and you're sending out messages about the club or uh, the, the, the association, and the person's a member, um, those are exempt. Uh, messages sent where they are in response to a request, an inquiry, or a complaint 
where the message was solicited by the recipient. Um, you can always reply to a request, an inquiry, or a complaint. Uh, messages sent in regard to a legal obligation. For example, if you have some sort of uh, requirement under the Travel Industry Act to notify uh, somebody who's purchased a product of changes in a hotel or, uh, or something that's changed in the vacation that they've purchased. Uh, that would be a legal obligation that you would be meeting by informing them of uh, a change in whatever they've purchased. Um, messages that complete or confirm a commercial transaction that's already been entered into. So if you're sending tickets or confirming a uh, reservation, that's fine. Uh, messages that provide safety, warranty, or recall information about a good or service the recipient has used or purchased. Um, Again, this, this is similar to, you know, uh, wow, civil war has broken out in Cuba. Um, maybe you should know that. Uh, that would not be caught under uh, CASEL. Uh, messages that are interactive two-way voice communications, so phone calls, uh, Skyping, uh, faxes to a telephone account, and voice messages sent to a telephone account. Uh, those are exempt, although they might be caught by other laws, uh, such as the uh, National Do Not Call Registry. Uh, so you might want to make sure that whoever you're sending these messages to are not on that registry. Uh, messages sent on behalf of a charity or political party or similar organization. And messages sent and received with the necessary information and opt-out mechanism are included in the platform. And that's like the LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook things that we were talking about earlier. A couple more questions by... Myri, I want to understand this legislation applies to more than just the travel industry. Yes, you have not been targeted. We have not been targeted. It applies everywhere. Right? It's, it's a federal piece of legislation. Uh, it applies across the country. And one of the other principles that we want to convey, we've said it in relation to a few questions, is that it also applies uh, internationally in the sense that if you are sitting in um, New York City and you are sending an email into Canadian computer systems, plural or singular, uh, this law will apply to you. Christine's comment about how does CASEL affect suppliers. So if the travel is purchased through an agency, can the cruise ship line send a CM directly to the consumer? Um, my interpretation would be yes, because there is a purchase. It's, it's through the agency, but it's of a product or, or service that's provided by the, uh, the cruise ship line directly. And, and the caveat to that would be one of the exemptions or exclusions that Asunta referred to is when you are following up on a booking. So if the understanding was the cruise company needs to deal directly with the customer in order to complete that booking or deal with this booking that they are leaving on, that's going to be fine. What's not going to be acceptable is the fact that the cruise company then, as a result of needing the email address to follow up with this, cannot then start sending emails directly to the consumer as a form of direct marketing, speaking purely now from a, a castle point of view, unless they also have consent in the same way that any agency or tour operator is obliged. The, the Act doesn't differentiate the kind of business or between kinds of business. Um, the similar requirements apply to everybody. So implied consent. Um, the reci implied consent exists, as uh, we mentioned before if the recipient has conspicuously published or disclosed uh, his, her, its email address and have not stated they do not want to receive a CM and the CM is relevant to the business role. Like I said previously, sending travel deals to the HR manager might not be cool, but sending it to you know, the assistant of the VP who deals with all his travel might be acceptable. Uh, or if you have an existing business relationship or non-business relationship. An existing business relationship exists if the person has purchased, leased, bartered a good or service from you in the previous two years. 
and here the implied consent expires two years after the purchase was made, or whenever the consent is withdrawn, or if the recipient has made an inquiry about a product or service in the past six months. And here are the expiry date is six months after the inquiry. Express consent does not expire, but as with implied consent, can be withdrawn at any time. Uh, you must be able to prove express consent was granted. So when the consent was received, what the, con the consent was received for, what types of messages, uh, and that when you received express consent, uh, you have to show that you provided the necessary information. Uh, so the contact information, the opt-out um, information, you don't necessarily have to have an opt-out op option when they sign up, but you have to notify them that they can opt-out. When asking for express consent, you should make sure that the request is clearly identified and not bundled in with terms of sale or un other unrelated matters. Um, it's not acceptable, for example, uh, to have it as uh, a condition of a purchase or a condition of entering the contest. Uh, it has to be separate and obvious and the person has to know they're agreeing to it. Um, there's the requirement for the recipient to actively choose to opt in to receiving them as opposed to, to opt out. Um, having to uncheck a pre-checked box and inclusion by default are not acceptable. Uh, the opt-in language should clearly state the purpose of the CEM. So if you're going to be sending them travel deals, you can't later on also start sending them, uh, you know, ads about cars, cars or, uh, or other unrelated uh, matters if they have not consented to them previously. You have to include the name of the organization seeking consent with their contact info, which must include an address or PO box, um, a phone number, and an email or website address, and indicate that the recipient can choose to unsubscribe at any time. Uh, Esther, your question, do you have an example? Uh, we don't have examples in the slides, but if you go over to the Travel Watch uh, website, you will uh, find some examples that we are aware of as to where consent uh, being obtained properly is set out. Okay, and there's a transition clause. So if there's an existing business relationship uh, on July 1st, 2014 because of an inquiry or purchase in the past and you have already communicated by CEM previously with that recipient, then the implied consent is grandfathered for the three-year transition period, so it doesn't expire until July 1st, 2017. However, it can be withdrawn, and implied consent that exists, um, if, there's, if the implied consent comes into existence after July 1st, the normal six-month and two-year expiration periods apply. So if somebody makes an inquiry on July 2nd or a purchase on July 2nd, they, you do not have the benefit of the three-year transition period. It's the six months or two years after the inquiry or purchase. Uh, due to the nature of the implied consent and the transition clause, it's important to get express consent uh, wherever possible before uh, the implied consent expires and to keep track of the expiry dates of implied consent on a going forward basis. And I'm sorry, we missed your uh, question, Joan. That was an intentional review implied consent. If they disclose the email address to you, is that only part of a business sale or transaction? No. Uh, you could be walking around at the mall uh, with a big board on your chest that says, I am a travel counselor. Give me email addresses. That would be perfectly acceptable, under CASEL anyway. Um, the person could hand you their business card or the person could hand you their business card uh, when you meet that person at a, a party at which you're picking up or dropping off one of your children, the issue then is they have disclosed that email address to you. There's nothing on the business card uh, that suggests they don't want to receive email, and you can then send them email. If you understand that the kind of email you're sending them has to do with travel, assuming you're sending them travel email. Lost audio? 
interesting. Still there. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, hopefully, okay, good. So you do have audio. Good. Then we are at the conclusion, but let's try and deal with that last question. How would an existing relationship under the transition clause affect a business that itself is transitioning to another business? New name, new company, on or after July 1? Well, as long as the uh, people are informed that there is a change of the business name, uh, you'll be fine. You've still got consent to send emails, let's say, about travel deals, uh, and you are permitted to do that. It would be different if your company changed from selling travel to selling snowblowers, uh, because you certainly would not have consent to do that. And there is an express uh, provision in Castle that allows, for example, uh, a sale of an agency after the sale, the consent stays with the agency. Um, so the consent continues to exist after the sale of the business. All right, I said we deal with that last question. We will make this uh, one last question. How does Castle apply to doing business uh, with, a Canadi with the Canadian government? Do I have to receive their permission to send them email? Uh, once again, it would be determined not by the person receiving it, but by the nature of the email. And if it's a CEM, uh, you are going to need uh, permission. That is all we have time for, uh, folks. And as Jacqueline says, she will send you out the details, both the panels. We didn't quite get through all of them, uh, but that's okay because the goal was to answer questions. Thank you all very much for attending.